The Ford company on the River Rhine is one of Europe's leading car manufacturers. 15,000 people build 350,000 cars here every year. That's 1,800 units per day. One of the most produced models is the ever successful Ford Fiesta. With the Ford philosophy of an affordable car for everyone, almost 15 million cars have been made and sold to date. The jobs in Cologne's factory are sought after. Even though the pace in the starting years was formidable, the work was often dangerous and the manners coarse. The history of Ford on the Rhine is full of sore points, but the hardcore stay, often for their entire working lives, making the factory a successful operation and the city's most important employer. Summer 2011. Good news for the employees of the Ford factory in Cologne. Even in the midst of the global financial crisis, company headquarters in Detroit continue to bank on the car makers on the Rhine and guarantee every job for the next five years. And the prospects of this continuing in the coming decades are good too. Fritz Thielen himself worked for Ford for 33 years. He also has the memories of his father Anton. My father was a train mechanic. He fitted the running boards on the Model A. Anton Thielen was one of the first 618 Ford workers in Cologne to start production here in the late summer of 1931. They were proud to be building such a car, that they were part of that, even though my father couldn't afford one. On the 2nd of October 1930, the richest man in the United States came to Cologne, and thousands of spectators turned out to see him. Yeah, that's stand here. It was in the papers for a long time. My father took me to the events. I saw Henry Ford, although only from a distance, but I was among many thousands of people, and it was an experience for me as a child to see someone who was in the papers. For me, it was an experience that I was a man who was in the papers as a child. The scene in which Henry Ford is swinging the hammer during the laying of the foundation stone is legendary. When he wished the Germans good luck, he had just laid off 50% of his workforce in the United States. For Ford, the key to inexpensive cars for all was in the production line, a system that founding father Henry Ford had seen decades earlier in the slaughterhouses of Chicago. The city on the Rhine had never seen anything like it, an entire factory dominated by assembly lines. I know that my father always said you don't even have time to say anything to your colleagues. With increasing job training, the work pace was increased. The workers started with 60 vehicles per day. After a week, it was 120. The number at full capacity, 170. That's 22 vehicles per hour, or one every three minutes. It was very hard work. I noticed that as a child when I met my father from work sometimes and I saw the people coming out. I thought back then that they all looked exhausted. They had had enough. A trained railway engine fitter, Henry Ford from Dearborn, Michigan, always rejected criticism about the high work pace. Turnover among the workers was high, but Ford attracted new ones with wages that were unparalleled at the time. Earning money was important to father, and Ford paid generous hourly rates. But the snag was in the small print. The first two hours of overtime weren't paid. The period of notice was just a day, and being sent home for days or even weeks without pay was considered normal. Even though the Model A was available for just 2,500 marks, Ford cars were difficult to sell in Germany. There was a hostile attitude towards foreign vehicles, and Ford was openly attacked by the German competition for years. The main criticism was German quality couldn't be knocked up by the minute like that. When the Wall Street crash then hit Germany with full force after a two-year delay, in autumn 1931, car sales came to a complete halt. 
400 of the 600 employees were sent home from one day to the next. That initially made almost no impact on Cologne's labour market. There were more than 150,000 industrial jobs in Cologne, so Ford was a small fish, and unemployed men were everywhere in Cologne in the early 1930s. They searched for jobs and distraction between the docks and the city hall. It was very much Henry Ford's vision of unlimited economic growth that fascinated contemporary politicians. He was already 66 at this time and had long ago written his memoirs. He had already sold 15 million Model Ts, his first car built on an assembly line. His production methods were the start of the motorization of the world, and they showed the way. But even at this time, he was never shy of a surprise. In contrast to the time when Ford Germany was based in Berlin, he now had German partners on his side who helped fund the new factory. 40% of the new factory stocks were owned by the Leverkusen-based company IG Farben. With this joint venture, Ford's direct investments were limited, and the use of global patents could be secured behind the scenes. Cologne's Ford factory appeared on the horizon, at least, as a partly German company. The factory building, right on the banks of the Rhine, was to look like a major factory should, and all aspects, such as production and administration, were to be united in one group of buildings. The competition to build it was won by the Essen architect Edmund Körner, an Eastie who had come into the public eye thanks to his designs for the synagogue and the Folkwang Museum in Essen. He opted for a no-nonsense building in the Bauhaus style. The contractors, Bauvens and Holzmann, only had seven months in which to complete the project, and most of that was over winter. After that, the factory was to be ready to start operating. Almost all the stages of the construction work have been captured on film. The key wall, costing more than 16 million Reichsmarks, was the most expensive part of the entire complex. The ceiling construction in the new hall also set new engineering standards. The mushroom-shaped supports generate open spaces more than 12 meters wide. These concrete columns go 8 meters into the ground. They support the factory's own heat and power plant in the boiler house. The chimney, still unplastered here, was the factory's landmark for 50 years. At the sides of the main building, additional halls were built using modern steel construction. Externally, the cars underwent a huge change. Up until then, car bodies had been made out of wooden frames with sheet metal plates screwed onto them. In 1932, Ford made the first car with a molded all-metal body. The new vehicles were already being made in line with aerodynamic principles and were to shape the look of the cars over the next 25 years. Ford wasn't able to sell the cars in Germany with the image of the American way of driving. So he gave the products and the factory a purely German and maybe even local Cologne image. The models were given names such as Eiffel, Rhein, Rhineland, Ruhr, Taunus, and this one, the Ford Köln, all names of the 30s. At the start of 1933, with the Ford Köln, the factory had a small car in its range that was available for less than 2,500 marks. The economy version, with a 21-horsepower engine and plywood body, was even available for just shy of 2,000 marks. March 1933. Adolf Hitler had been Chancellor for the past 10 weeks, and the Nazis got 39.6% of the votes in Cologne's city council elections. Ford, as an American company, remained unchallenged at first, and the initial measures of the Nazi transport policy put the automobile manufacturers into a cautiously optimistic mood. In April 1933, the vehicle tax for new cars was abolished, and insurance premiums were lowered by 30%. 
These tax breaks were designed to stimulate the economy. By the end of the year, 1933, Ford managed to produce 5,000 cars. In 1934, production in Cologne crossed the 10,000 mark for the first time. The company now tried to rub shoulders with the regime. That was the prize for unconditional access to the growing automobile market in Nazi Germany. The shares in Ford Cologne during all the boom years to come were largely held in the United States. But the suggestion to the people in the Third Reich was that the factory was an automobile equivalent of the watch on the Rhine. Cologne, the city with the cathedral and the jolly way of life. On the outskirts of town, right on the banks of the Rhine, is a German factory, Ford. This is Ford, a German factory on a German river. Thousands of Germans come to work here every day, bolstering the reputation of German labor. They're creating a good product with hard-working hands and the experience of three decades. They're producing cars for low prices, perfect in quality and form. The label on the glass guarantees the car's been checked. The things cars had to do started changing rapidly. They had to be more robust, go faster and go further on one tank. A limousine with 90 horsepower and a top speed of 130 kilometers per hour was available for 5,000 marks. Germany's cheapest eight-cylinder was the Ford Eiffel, a star in the automobile heavens at the time. Even girls were interested in new Ford vehicles and Agatha Hare was one of them. She was fascinated by the technology. But to the complete bafflement of her girlfriends, she dreamed of a proper lorry. With solid rubber tires and a big steering wheel. They told me I was crazy. I wanted to be a pilot. For me, the lorry was the next best thing after being a pilot because I didn't have the money to become a pilot. Soon she would make her dream come true, and Ford was on a roll. Ford world tested and from Cologne on the Rhine. Production increased to more than 20,000 cars in 1936. Two years later, Ford produced 36,000 cars, putting the company third in the German car market after Opel and Adler, and second in the lorry market. In 1937, Henry Ford was received by Adolf Hitler. They wanted to discuss a project to create a German vehicle for Hitler to sell to the people. Ford, here with his son Edsel, knew that nobody could produce vehicles more efficiently than he could. But he was enough of a realist to know that as an American, he wouldn't be able to build this car. And so he arranged with Hitler that the production of the future Volkswagen Beetle should be built to his plans. He then instructed the manager to open the door for Ferdinand Porsche's engineers. So the strength through Joy Beetle and the future military jeep-type Wehrmachtskübel had American pedigrees. And Henry Ford received the highest German medal that could be awarded to a foreigner. In the summer of 1939, Ford had presented a new type of car, a family saloon. Its name, the Towners. Although war was already in the air, the hunchback Towners, as it was called, sold 4,000 in the second half of 1939. By 1942, a total of 7,000 Towners cars had left the factory for a price of 2,800 Reichsmarks each. Then, production was stopped in favor of trucks. It wasn't produced anymore. The factory just made lorries for the military, and in the end it only made so-called mules, caterpillar vehicles. The tracked Rhine lorry, this is what the models looked like that Fritz had to produce during his apprenticeship. On the 1st of September 1939, the Nazi army had attacked Poland. In 1940, the Netherlands, Belgium and France, and the V8 was on all the front lines to overrun the neighbouring countries. Between September 1939 and the beginning of 1945, the Ford factory produced around 90,000 army vehicles of very different types for Hitler's army. Ford's order books were full to the brim. The company could hardly keep up with demand. Ford advertised with the new image of the armaments factory. This is where the reliable German Ford vehicles, the loyal helpers of the Nazi army and economy were built. The proximity of Henry Ford to Hitler wasn't new. 
For years, the man from Dearborn is said to have financially supported the Nazi party and even Hitler personally. Ideologically, he undoubtedly shared Hitler's hatred of the Jews, documented in his book The International Jew. The text, large sections of which strike us as completely appalling, can now be read in its entirety online. In 1942, the war became a war of attrition, and it became almost impossible to cope with the orders for munitions. The work week was increased to 44 hours, but even that wasn't enough. The workers' performance dropped rapidly. Almost half of the regular staff were soldiers on the front. And so the Germans first tried to recruit skilled labour in the occupied areas, such as here in Poland, where they used posters and cinema advertising. When that wasn't enough either, people were arrested on the streets and taken to Germany to do forced labour. In the summer of 1943, every second Ford employee working in production was from Russia or the Ukraine. With around 3,000 forced workers, Ford had one of the city's largest labour camps. They treated the prisoners of war really disgustingly. People saw that but nobody said anything. Ford didn't just have foreign women workers. Many German women replaced their menfolk on the home front, as it was called. For many, it was a chance to stand on their own two feet, for Agatha Hare, for example. During the war in 1942, the Ford factory lacked drivers, because they'd all gone to be soldiers. They only had older drivers. The fleet had 60 vehicles, of which maybe 40 had drivers. Then they tried to get women. I read that in the paper. I went, highly pregnant, and introduced myself to Mr. Schellbach. He was the manager at the time. He asked me, when can you start? I was due in mid-December, so I said, at the beginning of January, because I thought the worst would be over. But the baby was stubborn and was only born on the 28th of December. But I still started on the 2nd or 3rd of January. And so Agatha, the first woman lorry driver at Ford, entered a real man's world. She demanded equal pay and got it too. My colleagues were very sceptical at first because I was a woman. But that had changed after a week. And so Agatha set off on her daily rounds to bring materials to Cologne for the Ford production line. Because of the threat of bombing, Ford had moved some production sites to the nearby countryside, an ideal distance for the young mother. The furthest I had to go was Zollingen, which was good, because I was still nursing. I always did one trip, and then I nursed my baby, and then I did my next trip, and then I was put on long-distance routes. Her routes took her to occupied neighbouring Czechoslovakia, France, Belgium and the Netherlands. The loads were always waiting for us. We didn't always know what we were carrying. Lorries full of fenders or drive rods or carburettors or tyres, things like that. Whatever Agatha and her long-haul colleagues brought in was immediately unpacked and used in the factory. The war was getting closer and closer to Cologne every day. More than 600 bombing raids were launched on the city, including residential areas from 1942 on. But production in the factory continued at full capacity. For Agatha, a trip out of the city increasingly became a moment of respite from the chaos. So that's all. I always looked for the cathedral. I didn't have a religious upbringing, but I always checked whether the cathedral was still standing when I was on my way back. I didn't always see it, because the city was enveloped in smoke. I couldn't even see the spires. Then you were back in the war, 
Whereas on the road, you were safer. Agatha had to continue driving in ice and snow through the Eiffel, Luxembourg, the Ardennes to Antwerp, as long as the roads were free and the tyres were intact. We got flat tyres on every long-distance route because we had the poorest tyres of the whole fleet. They had no tread by the end because the lorries on the big car park had all the new tyres. There were a few clever workers who chucked them into the Rhine here, but they weren't from the lorry fleet. I had a colleague who was a couple of years older than me. We decided to sabotage the place and we did that a lot. The boxes from customs stood along the Rhine here and once they'd been approved by customs, they were nailed shut. We took out carburetors or other important spares, and then we chucked them into the Rhine. We usually did that before we went to work. We started work at seven, so we agreed to meet at six. Sabotage in the factory, and not just by Fritz, was talked about everywhere. I thought it was great. My father was in a concentration camp from the first day to the last. We knocked the tops off milk bottles and in the middle of the night we went onto the car park, which was strictly forbidden, and we put the glass in front of the wheels. When the lorries got going, they blew their tyres. Fritz hoped these acts of sabotage would help to shorten the war, even if just by a few minutes. Ford never caught him, but he was arrested for being a member of the Edelweiss pirates. He managed to escape twice, whereupon he went into hiding, thereby surviving the war. During this time, air raid warnings could be heard day and night. Ford, out in the open, was an easy target, but until then the bombers had only ever flown over the factory, dropping their bombs in the surrounding towns or in the city. The rumours that sparing the factory had already been agreed with the Allied governments wouldn't go away. Everything was destroyed, but the Ford factory was completely intact. Nothing was touched. Autumn 1944, another four months till the end of the war in Cologne. The Americans were already on the Rhine when Ford was still producing lorries. When the artillery shells fell closer and closer, Ford stopped production. Agatha thought about getting herself and a few friends to safety and remembered the many lorries that were now in the factory grounds unguarded. They were on the car park, hundreds of them, and they all had a key. With the courage of despair, she snuck onto the grounds of the factory and took a three-and-a-half-ton lorry for their escape to the countryside to the east of the city. I went for it and I crawled across the car park on my stomach. Then we drove off. With several women in the cargo area, she drove through the ruins of the city towards the Deutz suspension bridge across the Rhine. It had been badly damaged by bombs, but it was still in operation. Hundreds of fugitives were trying to get across the Rhine. To make things worse, the engine gave up the ghost halfway across. Hermann Schneider came and fixed it for me, and then we drove off the bridge, and then the bridge fell into the water. Suddenly, the bridge, full of people and vehicles, turned to the side, bent, and finally fell into the river. This disaster at the end of the war probably claimed 500 lives, including several colleagues from the Ford lorry fleet. Agatha only just escaped. Eight days later, on the 6th of March, 1945, the first US soldiers reached Cologne Cathedral. They had conquered a mound of ruins that was still home to an estimated 40,000 people. On the morning of that same day, the 3rd Armoured Division of the US Army reached the Ford factory. For six long weeks, the Rhine was now the new front line of the war. 
On the other side of the Rhine, the army and Hitler youth barricaded themselves and fired shells at the Ford works, causing more damage to the factory than had been caused during the entire six years of the war. Inside, there was a substantial lorry production line again, which was working for the US Army. Every available part was used. 1948 was the year of change. A Ford lorry carried the mortal remains of the three kings back to the cathedral. The cathedral was ceremonially reopened by hundreds of thousands of believers. The Deutschmark was introduced that summer. The new banknotes, 40 marks for everyone, the starting capital for a new phase of life. Things changed in the factory too. After a break of almost five years, Towner's cars were back on the company car park and the Thailand's father and son were back at work. My father came back from imprisonment. He started again straight away. We started in the grinding shop. With hardly any customers, Ford was already advertising in the cinema again. My first Ford was the Hunchback. I was too scared to use the small brake pedal because I thought it would go out the back. I was so proud of that car. Agata, who once loved lorries so much, had become Cologne's first trained female driving instructor. Now she and 12,000 other car owners drove through the city streets. There were no new cars about. Most of the town's vehicles were shipped abroad straight away. With more than 70,000 sales, the Taunus became a surprise success in three years. And it's a name that was very closely linked to the identity of the Ford factory in Cologne for an entire decade. But the workforce in the young Federal Republic of Germany, so soon after the Third Reich, was still deeply divided. Many workers felt the transition from old to new was too smooth. My supervisor had just been a Nazi, but where was I supposed to go? I had trained at Ford and thought I'd carry on working there. I didn't think that all the Nazis would still be there, but they were. That was the odd thing. 40 Ford employees were arrested by the military authorities at the end of the war. Most of them were released again and then re-employed by Ford. Many of the Nazi victims working at Ford felt this was an imposition. The rehiring of a notorious company doctor could only be prevented by a strike. Fritz Thailand left the company for 10 years. He only returned when most of the old men had retired. But the legal repercussions of Ford during the Nazi era continued for decades and left no room for illusions about how a key industry behaves in wartime if it wants to make money. The statement that the factory in Cologne and those controlled by Cologne in the occupied areas were outside of the influence of Detroit is only true on paper. Ford was only to admit as much towards the end of the century. In 1952, Ford announced the first new development since the end of the war, the Taunus 12M. The M stood for masterpiece, and it was evidently meant to conquer the world. Ein komfortabler Wagen, dessen volle Rundsicht sie die Landschaft wirklich genießen lässt. Ein sicherer Wagen, mit dem sie jede Straße beherrschen und von erstaunlicher Wirtschaftlichkeit semi-automated or even fully automated production facilities were built everywhere, doing more than human labor could have on its own. But the end of the automation process was nowhere yet in sight. The hunger for cars seemed to have become insatiable. In the mid-50s, there were 20,000 registered vehicles just in Cologne. That was three times more than only five years earlier, and they all wanted to get downtown. The Nord Zutfahrt cut a broad swathe through Cologne's historic quarters. The city committed itself to being a car-friendly one. Many of Cologne's long-standing residents missed the former tranquility. Ja, 
There was a lot of traffic and it was rapidly increasing. Much to the joy of the car retailers, the economic miracle came to Ford as well. The towner's masterpieces of 12M and 15M were real hits, and the FK1000 was the van which was later renamed Transit. Der stärkste seiner Klasse, Ford Eilfrachter, schnell und wirtschaftlich, robust gebaut, Ford Eilfrachter. Between 1953 and 1957, the number of Ford employees doubled to more than 10,000. Within just three years, the workforce grew to 20,000. Then the factory was expanded bit by bit until the land reserved since 1930 was full. Surveys among the employees revealed shocking results in the early 60s. More than half complained about their direct superiors. 76% and more thought the workplace was too high. In addition, the inhumane working conditions kept causing serious accidents. With increasing safety measures, the number of accidents decreased, but 80% of all respondents would be willing to change the conditions at Ford by industrial action. That was the signal for the German Metal Workers Union, IG Metall, to at last get involved with Ford. Although there had been free labour unions under the leadership of local man Hans Böckler since 1946, and Ford had had a proper workers' council, usually with communist leanings, the old leaders fought against the new strategy of the young generation, which was not so much revolutionary as reform-oriented. They wanted to professionalise the tasks of the workers' council and banked on a policy of one step at a time. A large-scale campaign by IG Metall, which for its part didn't mince its words, managed in just a few months in the early 60s to recruit 6,000 Ford employees as members. The first goal was, for the workforce, to negotiate their pay with the company itself. Ford refused. After arguments in court, the company backed down from direct confrontation and became a member of the Employers' Association, Gesamt Metall. These were the golden economic years, and Ford's need for employees seemed insatiable. By 1960, there were almost a thousand Italians working in the factory. There were only nine from Turkey, but in the following year, there were already 3,000. They were called guest workers, and it was expected of the guests that they would return home again after a certain time. The mass demand for automobiles wasn't just a problem for the capacity of many a car factory. Even in those days, critics warned that there would be a traffic and environmental collapse. 80,000 cars were registered in Cologne, four times as many as five years previously. Cologne now had six road bridges over the Rhine and the first complete motorway ring in Europe. But the open road like here on Germany's first six-lane highway, now the A3, was mostly only a beautiful dream on weekends. No sooner were new roads built than they were congested again, at least during rush hour. Yeah. We paid close attention to how the roads changed because we were so enamoured with the motorways. Of course, when you were in a traffic jam, you thought about it. But I didn't want to change anything. We all thought it must go on. How else could it be? Agata's driving school was buzzing. But in reality, driving isn't a matter of intelligence, it's a matter of skill. Some people have more practical abilities than others. I had really bright drivers behind the wheel who never got their license because they couldn't get it together. Graduates or labourers, hardly anyone wanted to be just a pedestrian anymore. In 1962, 25,000 people in Cologne took their driving test. 20% of them were women, and Ford Advertising now discovered them as independent customers. Sie bieten dir Luxus, die feinsten Stoffe, den ganzen Himmel, alles und mehr. 
und schon bist du gefangen. Eingefangen vom Charme und Temperament. Fängst selbst an zu flirten und merkst plötzlich, dass du schon Ja gesagt hast. Wann äh, lassen Sie Ihre Frau eine Probefahrt machen? Der Taunus 17M. Ein Wagen mit Gesicht. Ein Wagen mit Profil. Mit der Stromform, die elegant und zweckmäßig zugleich ist. Ein Wagen, der es in sich hat. Attraktiv. Und vornehm zugleich. Und verlässlich. Bremst und steht. But despite the emergency stop, the new, according to Ford, rational line was a success. Every fifth car bought in Germany came from Cologne in those days. And everyone who drove such a car was constantly reminded of that, whether he or she liked the city on the Rhine or not. But by then, Ford had put out its feelers to build further branches, such as in Belgium. Ford cars had been an import hit here for years. In 1962, Ford acquired premises in Genk, and just three years later, the 100,000th Taunus 12M, made in Belgium, was produced. In 1967, the first economic crisis after the war abruptly dampened consumers' demand for cars. The factory bridged the lull with short time working, but Ford was harder hit than other brands. People now considered their cars a bit old-fashioned. But then, the factory in Cologne came out with a new model in January 1969. It took off like a rocket and turned Ford's battered image completely upside down. Capri gibt Ihnen, was Sie wollen. Fünf verschiedene Motorentypen decken die Skala vom sparsamen bis zum sportlichen Fahren ab. Der schnellste der GT ist in 11 Sekunden von 0 auf 100. Never before had one model driven up production and sales of all types from one single factory so much. In six months, over 300,000 cars, 55,000 of them Capris. Extra shifts had to be worked to satisfy the demand. Extras betonen ihre persönliche Note, Liegesitze vorn. GT-Kraft. Lederumwickeltes Sportlenkrad. Kartenlampe. Autoradio. Fritz Thielen appreciates the car with which the people of Cologne prefer to overtake a classic Mercedes. We built the Granada in Cologne. I drove several models of it myself. In general, that was the best car for me. The way to Europe was now firmly set. It didn't just express itself through the car's names. Fritz, an experienced production technician, was sent to the branches in Saarlouis and Spain. More than 50,000 men and women were on the payroll of the main branch in Cologne in 1970. Wages and salaries were still negotiated by unions and employer associations. But Ford paid according to output, by cars produced, with overtime and shift work. But the workers often had to be patient because negotiations about reforms could drag on for decades. Sometimes the new opportunities were overestimated. Co-determination meant that the workers had to come to an agreement with management. That was not a charter for spontaneous industrial action. After the oil shock of 1973, it was hard to maintain employee figures of 50,000 and more. Mass layoffs didn't take place at Ford but 4,000 employees were paid off, as were employees nearing retirement. Even the seemingly never-ending automation at the hands of robots and computers cost thousands of jobs, while creating new ones in different places. Then Ford developed an answer to the energy and environmental crisis. It was developed from scratch in Cologne and also built with Cologne in charge. 
The car was ridiculed by some because of its size, but it soon outsold all of its predecessors. It was a winner for Ford in Cologne and Europe well into the new millennium, the Ford Fiesta. It would be a few more years until the cars of the 80s and 90s became legends. But the men and women of the first and second generations at Ford were still there. Fritz Thielen remained a production technician in the Y Hall until his retirement. He often took time off. He visited young people in schools and told them about his experiences during the Nazi era. That way, he did important educational work with the support of his supervisor. He was awarded the Federal Order of Merit for that. Agatha Hartfelt, née Herr, who saw Henry Ford lay the foundation stone, has devoted her whole life to automobiles. I would have liked to be a doctor, but I was satisfied with everything else in my life. It was filled to the brim with everything you can imagine. Now 91 years old, she sold her last car in spring 2011. Those who visit the factory on the Rhine today won't find much of the old car factory that started as Ford Motor Company Köln. The hall's interior is usually replaced every 10 years, and from an engineering perspective, the modern cars have hardly anything in common with those of the past. There are only memories of the old jobs. No one knows what cars will be built here over the coming decades, or by whom or what, human or machine. There's only one thing that's fairly certain. The production lines will keep running. The most important thing for everyone who will come to work tomorrow is that the pay is right and that they have someone they can rely on completely.